Praise the Lord. Well, before you have a seat, go ahead and say hello to someone. Well, we hope you guys are having a good Sunday so far. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, welcome to Powerhouse Church. We are so excited to start in the Word because the more we read the Word, the more we are like Jesus. So we are going to start in Galatians 4, 1 through 6. And it says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, so much that we can come before you in all of our hurts, all of our desires, all of our wishes, all of our hopes, Lord, and we just lay them at the feet of Jesus, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you help us to align ourselves to the mind of Christ, to align ourselves to the will of God, to what it is that you want to accomplish here. So we lay aside the slave of this world and we receive the adoption of your spirit, Lord. We put on the mind of Christ and we welcome you for what it is that you want to do in our hearts and in our minds today. In Jesus' name, amen. My beautiful queen, another round of applause. Well, good afternoon. I hope everybody is doing well and everybody is enjoying uh, their summer. We're so grateful for what God has begun here at Powerhouse Church and what he's continuing to do here. I want to welcome those who may be joining us online. We're so glad that you've joined us. And we've just been having an awesome time as we've been walking through the book of Romans. That it literally is the constitution of God's word. That when we can understand the depths of what Romans teaches us, It would get us in a place where we would hear God's word, we'd be able to understand God's word and apply it to our lives in such a way that I believe it would transform us. Well, last week we learned that our sin is a capital crime against God. And that sin is deserving of eternal condemnation. We learned that in our own strength we had no way of overturning a guilty verdict. That the judgment was just. And condemnation was deserved for everyone. But when all hope seemed to be lost, we threw ourselves on the mercy seat of the court. We gave our lives to Jesus, and Jesus was condemned in our place. And the Holy Spirit gave us new life as we were born again. The Apostle Paul makes this powerful declaration for those who were in Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. 
I love this verse. This is one of the favorite verses in the Bible because this verse speaks of our eternal security. See, church, we went from being condemned to being set free from all charges. See, this is the beauty of God's grace. And this is why God's grace is so amazing. Because it can turn a sinner into a saint. See, God made him who knew no sin become sin for us so we could become the righteousness of God. This is because the Spirit of God did something that the law of Moses could never do. Verse 2 and 3 says this, For the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new beginning, being, has set you free from the law of sin and death. It says, for what the law could not do, that is overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power, being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued it and overcame it in the person of his own son. See, Apostle Paul is teaching these Jewish Christians about the law of the spirit of life. See, the law of Moses was a tutor. It could only reveal the sin problem with no ability to fix it. But the law of the spirit, through the blood of Jesus, removes the penalty of sin. It brings forth a new birth as the spirit gives life. See, Apostle Paul said this in Romans 7, 18. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in his sinful nature. See, as long as we walk in the flesh, we have no ability to please God. See, our flesh can make us successful in this life. It can make us of the rich and famous. We could get the praise of man. We could have our name known. We could have a, a star on Hollywood Walk of Fame but it cannot give us eternal life. Jesus says this in John 6, 63. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. See, church, it's the spirit of God that gives us life, but it also gives us the ability to please God. This is why we don't try harder. We surrender deeper so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. We learned last week that the Holy Spirit not only gives us life, but he also teaches us, he leads us, he guides us, he inspires us, he empowers us, he fills us, and he gives us wisdom. So in light of that church, we must commune with the Holy Spirit daily. Because when we choose to operate without him, we'll find ourselves quenching the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And when we do this, by default, we'll always go back to our flesh. Listen to verse 5. It says, for those living according to the flesh sets their minds on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those who are living according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit, his will, and purpose. See, we learned last week that whoever controls the mind will control the life. Whoever controls your mind will control your life. This is because when we're in our flesh, we'll always be focused on worldliness and carnality. We learned last week that our life in Christ is never in neutral. See, either we're progressing in Christ or we're regressing in Christ, right? Right? See, we have to remember, God's goal for every fall of Christ is to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus. So when we are continuing to be conformed, we're progressing. We're becoming more like Jesus each and every day. But what happens is some Christians think that I'm in a good spot. I can just chill. I can just coast to the end of this life. And what happens is there's a slow drift that starts happening. And whether you realize it or not, you're actually regressing instead of progressing in Christ. See, this requires a conscious act of our will, not to walk in our flesh, but set our minds on the affections of Christ. But listen to this, church. 
but we can't stop walking in what we have not crucified. And we can't walk in the Spirit if we don't set our minds on the Spirit. This is because God can do a lot of things, but God can't do our part. Wait, I'm going to say that one more time. God can do a lot of things, but he can't do our part. See, the Spirit gives life, but the Spirit requires our cooperation. The Holy Spirit is the greatest gift that God has given us outside of Jesus. Like, one of my sayings is that the Holy Spirit is the Christian life. He is God's superpowered anointing in us to accomplish God's purpose in every area of our lives. So guess what? We must allow the Holy Spirit to have full control so that we're under his influence in every area of our lives. Well, we closed our time last week with the understanding that it's the Holy Spirit who does that regenerative work in us when we're born again. We learned that it's the Holy Spirit who seals us in the day of redemption. That day when we will see Jesus face to face. Because it is the Holy Spirit who gives life. Well, today we're going to continue our series as we go through Romans. The title of our message today is The Spirit of Adoption. The Spirit of Adoption. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, thanking you, Lord, that one more day you allowed us to be in the land of the living. God, we thank you that every day is a precious day that we can live for you. Father, we thank you for your perfect word that converts the soul. So we ask right now, God, that your spirit will come and speak through me. That I will decrease, Lord, that you would increase. That your word will go forth in power. So, Father, I pray that we'd all block out our thoughts, our distractions about anything else. That we would focus on your word. God, may we have fertile ground in our souls to receive your word today. So, Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and honor of the good that your word will do in us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, recently my wife and I extended our family. We don't have any real kids yet, but we do have furry kids. So there was this dog that I saw on Facebook, and I was like, we got to have this dog. So I remember tagging my wife in the post, and she's like, yes, we need to get this dog. And we were able to adopt Kingston on June 28th. And that's a picture of Kingston. Now, Kingston was abandoned in an area in California where dogs were being bred. And one thing about dogs is, is that dogs are very loving and kind. They need someone to care for them, kind of like human beings. But this dog was in dire straits. Fortunately, he was rescued by an adoption agency, but this dog still needed a forever home. This would be the second dog that we would adopt in the last four years. And again, Kingston was in Mount Sacramento, California. And see, with dogs who are in fosters, they have a limited time that they have to be adopted. That if they don't get adopted in time, they could actually be put down. But we stepped up and we paid the price for Kingston's adoption. And so now we have three kids that we call. This is a picture of them. What I want us to understand is that something similar happened to us when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That it was Jesus that paid the price for our freedom when we were born again. And we experienced the spirit of adoption. See, when it came to Kingston, again, a foster home had a limited time that they had to get someone to adopt this dog. This is why they put them on social media. They're saying, hey, please help save this dog. Because there's so many dogs that don't have a home and they can't keep them. And so they end up putting these dogs down. But see, on the same token, when I thought about our adoption of Kingston, Jesus rescued us from our sin. That if we wouldn't have got adopted by the Spirit... One day when we died, we'd be condemned forever. See, before Jesus, we lived life the way that we wanted to, which was in disobedience to God's word. But since we have been ransomed, 
since we've been saved by Jesus, since we've been adopted by the Spirit, we are indebted to God. Now, this is a debt that we spend the rest of our lives in thanksgiving to God saving us. You know, when I think of Kingston, he's such a happy dog. It's like he so loves being there with us. We get him his own crate, and he gets fed a couple times a day. We take him on walks. Like, he is living a life. He went from a place of being abandoned, being abused, and being hurt to being loved. God wants to love you that same way. And he's willing to take his time with us. But I think sometimes we forget that we've been adopted. We forget that we are truly in the family of God. And so when someone pays your ransom, when someone saves you from condemnation, you owe them a debt. You are a debtor to them. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to start in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 14. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For as many who are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. What the Apostle Paul wants these Christians in Rome to understand is that they are indebted to Jesus for dying for our sins. But that debt is not paid by continuing to serve our flesh but on the contrary, because we all know that the wages of sin is death. So when we continue to try to live in something that's supposed to be dead, we forget that we've been rescued from condemnation. Because when someone saves your life, you got to say, I'm so thankful you, you saved me if it wasn't for you. So how does that look to go, you know, just walk away from that? He says, what can I do to repay you? How can I show you that I'm grateful that you saved me? And the father would say is, be like my son. Obey me. Walk with me. Have a deeper love relationship with me. That's how you can show me. And then I will show you who I created you to be. I will change your thoughts, your appetites, but it requires your part. See, that God doesn't expect us to just figure out how to love him. He showed us. And we respond to that love by loving him back the way that he's loved us. This is why when we, we have to live in the spirit. As I just mentioned, the Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift to us outside of Jesus. Because he's the one that helps us to please God. He gives us the power to obey God. Because walking in the spirit not only glorifies God, but it also keeps our flesh in check. Because we know what the word says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What I want you to know about that verse, that's not just some time. The spirit will always be willing, and the flesh will always be weak. What I want us to understand about life in Christ, it's an abundant life. There's supposed to be abundant life in the spirit of God. But I want you to know that that abundant life is funneled through the spirit of adoption. See, having the abundant life doesn't mean we won't have problems. It just means that problems won't have us. See, church, walking in the spirit, it's, it's a declaration that we are indeed children of God. And when we live life in the spirit, it helps us to maintain an eternal perspective. I want you to start thinking in your mind what an eternal perspective looks like. I'm going to give you a good example. My brother-in-law suddenly passed away this past Monday. It was shocking and devastating. My heart broke for my sister. It broke for their kids and extended family. And as I'm dealing with my emotions about this, I was sad, but I was also happy. Because I realized something, that Pastor James Cooper had finished his race. That he answered God's call to start and lead a church. 
He served his wife. He served his children. He served his congregation. He served his community with the love of Jesus. See, by, a lot, by living in the spirit, I don't have to say, why, God? God, how could you let this happen? I mean, he was a great man. God, why do good, bad things happen to good people? I could have had these questions running around in my mind. But because I have an eternal perspective, I understand that life is temporal. That it was never God's plan for us to be here forever. And then I could just look at God's word. I could just recall God's word in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, and just as it appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. So also Christ, having been offered once to bear sins of the many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. Amen. Amen. See, two things I realized. Number one, we all die by appointment. I mean, you may be late for all of your appointments, but you won't be late for this one. (laughs) Number two, Pastor James Cooper was in Christ. So I know that absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So although I miss him, although I'm sad for my sister and for everyone who lost him, I know that I will see him again. What about you? When something dies in your life, whether it's a relationship or a loved one, when you lose that job, when you get that diagnosis, how do you handle it? Do you have an eternal perspective or do you have a worldly one? See, I ask this question because I know this is an issue for the body of Christ. Because it was an issue for me when I was new in my faith. See, sometimes we misunderstand God and we misunderstand this world order. We can start thinking that, God, you're a good God. That means that good things should always happen to me. Never anything bad, God. There shouldn't be any pain. There shouldn't be any suffering. It should just be all goodness. And what happens is, is, then something happens. The bottom falls out of our life, like it did my life. That I went through a bitter divorce, and in that bitter divorce, I lost the ability to see my stepdaughter. And so I responded from a worldly perspective. I said, God, really? I mean, I led this little girl to you. I mean, I took her to church. I told her about Jesus. And she gave her life. And this is how you repay me, God? You just let her be taken away from me. And that broke me because I had a perspective about God that was worldly and not eternal. Listen to this, church. If we have a worldly perspective, when life gets hard, we will be prone to go back to the world. See, the Holy Spirit helps us to process these difficulties in life. He uses them to strengthen our faith and our trust in God. But when we don't walk in the Spirit, by default, we'll walk in our flesh, and that will create a spirit of fear. Listen to Romans 8.15. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. See, when a person's in bondage, they take on the mindset of a slave and they cower in fear. They struggle in life. They don't trust anybody. And they do whatever they have to to try to survive. But what I want us to know is that in Christ, those chains of bondage have been broken. See, we no longer have to be lonely. We no longer have to feel abandoned. We no longer have to fend for ourselves and be worried by life difficulties. This is because in Christ, we are adopted into God's kingdom family. This means that not only will we be provided for, 
but we can also have intimacy with God. So much so we can call out to God, Abba Father. See, Abba Father is this term of endearment that means daddy or papa. And whether we realize it or not, many of us have an orphan spirit because we had earthly parents that may have abused us and rejected us. This is why when God gave me the vision for this church, it was to build a family. We, we all come from different backgrounds. We've all gone through different things. So what I wanted to do here is create a place where no matter where you've come from, you know that you have a family here with God's people. <laughs> that we don't want a transaction relationship. We want to do life with you. We want to help carry your burdens. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. And I feel that's what the problem is in the Christian church in America, that it's so transactional. They forget the body of Christ means to be one body. There's a hand, there's a foot, there's an ankle. But we're all supposed to be connected. When porn part hurts, the whole body's supposed to hurt. We're supposed to pay attention to that hurting part. This is what the family of God is supposed to look like. And so it starts with all of us. Making a family that continues to grow bigger and bigger and bigger for the glory of God, but also for our edification. See, God the Father wants you to know that he never sleeps nor slumber, but he's always awake for our calls. Even though through our trying difficulties, we may feel like God is far off. The Holy Spirit connects our spirit and gives us the confidence that we are God's child, no matter what we're going through. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified together. See, church, we're not just adopted. We were adopted with benefits. See, in biblical days when an adoption took place, a son or daughter who was adopted, they received all the benefits as if they were part of the original family. And because God is a king and he has a kingdom, we too get to be heirs to God the Father and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen. See, even though we were adopted, we still get a great inheritance. But I want you to know is there is a stipulation for us to receive our inheritance. Remember again, God's goal is for every person to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus. So not only are we to love like Jesus, we're called to suffer like Jesus as well. See, our choice to choose to suffer for righteousness or suffer through hardships or suffer through physical or emotional pain, to suffer in any and every way that it comes to us, when we can do this without complaining but enduring it, that glorifies God. Amen. Amen. I get the slow clap there because nobody wants, no one wants to say, yeah, I want to suffer. Me, back here. You got some suffering for me? Great, I'll take it. No one's saying that. No one wants to suffer. And guess what? Jesus didn't want to suffer either. But Jesus cared more about pleasing his father so he would say, not my will, but your will be done. For example, two of Jesus' disciples, they wanted a special inheritance when they got to the kingdom age. They wanted to sit on his left side and also sit on his right side. Listen to how Jesus responded to them in Mark 10, 38. It says, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism of suffering and death, which I am baptized? They answered yes. And Jesus told them, yes, you're right. You, in fact, will suffer as he suffered. 
But what he told him is this is a place of honor that's already been prepared for other people. But even today, Jesus is asking me and he's asking you, are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to suffer for my namesake that my father may be glorified? See, we will all deal with trials and tribulations and even persecutions in this life. But the question is, is how will we choose to deal with them? We have two choices. We can either cave in so we don't have to suffer and do whatever we can do to get out of it, or we can entrust our lives to the Lord and suffer like Jesus. See, suffering will never be fun, but church, I promise you, suffering will be worth it. But when we choose not to suffer like Jesus, if we don't love like Jesus, we won't do it. It's kind of interesting because when we think about love, we don't think about suffering, right? We don't, we don't think about those things together. But Jesus could suffer because he loved his father. And so that's how those two kind of tie together. And so we will never choose to suffer like Jesus if we don't love Jesus and have the mind of Christ. This is because Jesus, he had an eternal mindset. He had an eternal mindset before he went to the cross. See, he could have focused on how painful the nails would be going into his hands. He could have been thinking about how he would be scorned and spit upon and, and hurt. He could have focused on those things. And just the agony of hanging on a rugged cross, slowly dying. Let's take a look at what was really going through Jesus' mind when he was on the cross in Hebrews 12 too. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised in the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. See, even though Good Friday was a good day for us, it was a bad day for Jesus. But joy was set before him. Because he chose to look past the pain and the shame on Friday and look toward the glorification on Resurrection Sunday. God is calling us to be like Jesus. By letting his joy be set before us as we endure whatever suffering this life may cause. Why? Because one day our Resurrection Sunday is coming too. This will be a day when we see Jesus face to face, where there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, but an everlasting joy. Amen. See, God wants us to know that he has a great reward for those who are willing to suffer for him in his life. But an eternal mindset is required. There's no way we're going to willingly suffer unless we're walking with the mind of Christ. Until we have this eternal perspective. See, what happens to us here in this life, we think that this is all there is. And so we don't want to suffer. We, we want things this way. But when we understand that this place is not our home, that it's temporary, this will help us to begin to have that eternal mindset. See, no matter how hard the suffering will be in this life, it's only temporary. And God will walk through all of it with us. But the glory that we receive will never be ending. And it will far outweigh any bad thing that we have to deal with in this life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.18. He says, For I consider that the suffering this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. See, we've all had to deal with some type of suffering and affliction because that's part of the human experience. I mean, if there was anybody outside of Jesus who suffered a lot, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was beaten with whips. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. He went hungry. He went thirsty. And he was always on the run for his life. But the Apostle Paul had an eternal mindset. He knew there was a great reward of where awaits those who endure suffering. 
And that great reward will be such a great of great uh, glory that it'll be beyond comparison. See, sometimes we think that we're just going through it. It can't get any worse. But God wants us to know no matter how bad it gets, I got something a billion times greater than the suffering that you're going through. And when I thought about all of this and what it really takes for us to have this eternal mindset and walk in that, it's faith. I mean, this is where faith comes in. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. It's believing what God said in his word, even though we don't have visible proof. I mean, when you think about faith, without faith, we can't even please God. Without faith, we can't even obey God. And we will never obey God if we don't love God. In church, if we don't love God, we won't be willing to suffer for God. What I want us to understand is intimacy is a process. Even though we're in Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. We still have to do our part by building a deeper and more intimate relationship with God. Because when we think of God, God is love, right? I mean, he proved that by sending us his son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have an eternal relationship with him. So how is your love going with God? Where do you stand with him? Would God say that you are loving him back? Or would he say your love is cold? Would he say your love is lukewarm? Let me say it another way. How is your love for the people God created? Because how can we say we love God who we can't see and we don't love the people that God created that we can see? Amen. See, when we think about what the greatest characteristic of a Christian can be, it's love. Because love will cause us to obey God, to please God and to be a blessing to one another. In church, for those who sincerely love God, by words and by action, God wants you to know something. He wants you to know that he has a big surprise waiting on you. That when you choose to love God and love the people he created in a growing way, that that's growing in you, God goes, I got some plan for you. Like, like it's such a surprise, I just, it's, it's going to be good. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. He says, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. God saying it's going to be so good, you could have never thought of it. You could have never dreamed of the goodness that I have prepared for you. Have you ever thought about why is that so important to God? Again, God wants us to be like his son. God is love. When we think about Jesus, he is love. So God is calling us to be love as well. So when we love God, we're going to obey God. We're going to live a life that brings him the greatest glory. See, God has created us in his own image because ultimately God created us for an eternal relationship with him. So we are God's greatest creation, so much so that everything that God created was for us. And so now the, the universe is in anticipation for the fullness of our adoption to God. Because the, the, the universe and everything that's in it, all of God's creation is just sort of waiting because they want this adoption to be fully realized. Let's look at Romans 8, 19 and 21. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it to hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. See, what we also must understand is that our present suffering is also connected with creation. Because like us, creation is suffering because of the sin that's in the world. 
In a wider scope, the entirety of God's created order is waiting for and anticipating a glorious change one day. See, sin not only corrupted human beings, sin also corrupted creation. And how does sin corrupt creation? Well, the corruption in, the corruption in creation is displayed through global warming, through volcanoes, through earthquakes, through floods, through droughts. That, that if we think about life, there's more and more that's happening, right? There's more and more floods. There's more and more hurricanes. And it seems like they're getting stronger and stronger. That natural disasters are happening more frequently than ever before. More powerfully, kind of like birth pains. See, when a woman is getting closer to giving birth, the pains that she has come faster, and they also come with more intensity. This is what we see happening with creation. Listen to verse 22 and 23. It says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together unto now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption of our body. This is because we're also a part of creation. We are created beings by God. So we too grown as our decaying bodies for the fulfillment of our adoption. See, while our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. And when you think we get older here, People, body parts stop working, right? Eventually, people need a hip replacement, a knee replacement, may need some hearing aids. They may get Alzheimer's. Like, our body is dying. They begin to get tired. Their physical bodies have kind of run its course. What's happening is there's a deep longing for what God has promised them who love him. And when we think about this world orders, the world's always telling us how we can get younger, right? They go, you want to get rid of those wrinkles? You want to feel young again? Take, this, take these vitamins. You want to do this? Have this plastic surgery. See, this world order is trying to not let us think about eternity. So it wants to try to make us look good now even though we're dying. Because when we really process eternity, it makes us start thinking where we're going to go. This is because the world order wants us to feel like we have more time. Have you ever talked to someone about Jesus and they always like, well, I got time. But we fail to realize is that people die every moment of every day. Every moment of every day, someone is dying. Again, it's appointed unto man to die once. And after that, the judgment. God doesn't guarantee anybody any more time. Even the fact that we're here right now is a miracle. It's by God's grace that we're still here. But one day our time will be up. And that's our greatest commodity is time. And God goes for those who know me, those who've had that spirit of adoption. Man, live the rest of your time here for me. I mean, if you think about God, it was enough that he sent his son. It's like, God, you don't do nothing else for me. I mean, I'm just grateful that you could save a wretch like me. But God goes, but I hear you. But I love you so much. I, gotta reward. I want to reward you. I want to reward you for the suffering that you're willing to go through and endure. I want to reward you for your faithfulness, for your integrity. I want to reward you for your love. I want to reward you because each and every day you're choosing to become more and more like my son. God is so, so good. I mean, we say that all the time. God is good, isn't he? But he really is. I mean, I wish there was another word I could come up with because good doesn't seem to do it. It's like good times infinity. That's who God is. He loves us so, so much. What I want us to know is that there's a desire in all of us to live forever. Right? No one's going to raise their hand. You ready to die? No one raise their hand and say that. 
we like, I would love it if I was alive and Jesus came back and he just raptured me. We, we would love that. What I want us to understand is that God put that in us. But that location is not here in this life, but with him in the next. <laughs> See, church, one day we're going to take off these sin suits and we're going to put on our perfected, incorruptible suits. What we have been longing for will finally come to pass. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It says, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. See, church, the totality of the spirit of adoption will be experienced in this moment. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more death as we will be perfected in Christ Jesus forever and ever and ever. Amen. It's where our hope in Christ Jesus would no longer be deferred, but actualized that we have the spirit of adoption. Verse 24 says this, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Well, the answer to that question is a person does not hope in what he sees because he can see it with his eyes. Hope is a joyful expectation about the future. So trusting that our future life in Christ will be far greater than the depths of our suffering in this life that's what hope looks like. That's what real hope looks like. Because faith is a substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence of things that are not seen. See, God gets so much glory when we believe in what we can't see. And we operate as if we really already see it. So when we can have this kind of hope, even in the midst of our suffering, that speaks a lot about our faith. Amen. Romans 8.25 says, But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with it with perseverance. As I close this message, what I want us to remember is that our hope in, is in the spirit of adoption. That we were adopted into the family of God when we accepted Jesus Christ by faith. And the spirit of adoption leads to eternal life. Some days will be harder than others. Some days we're going to go through it. Nothing will go right. We're going to be suffering physically, emotionally. We're going to lose people. Things are going to happen that are very traumatic for us. But God is calling us to be patient. He's calling us to bear one another's burden. This is, again, why we need to build a family here. So when John is going through something, John goes, I'm hurting right now. I lost my mom. We're like, we, we go around John. We pray for him. We encourage him. God is calling us to walk by faith and confidence that through our adoption that we truly are sons and daughters of God. See, you may not always feel like it, and you may not always act like it, but when you got adopted... It was by the grace of God through the Spirit of God. So church, don't let what you might be dealing with doubt God's love for you. Don't let your unanswered prayers make you get angry with God. But choose to have an eternal mindset because soon and very soon we're going to see the King. And when we do, our hope that we can't see, it'll be revealed to us as we experience the fullness and the glory of God's goodness. Church, if you're in Christ Jesus, but I want you to know the Spirit of God has adopted you, that you are in the family. Now it's time to just walk that out. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. So I'm not going to let this momentary affliction that I'm dealing with in this life stop me from giving God my very best, loving him, serving him, and giving him everything that he's given me. 
I want to spend the rest of my life going, God, I want to pay back to you what you've given me. I know I could never do it, but I'm going to try my best. I'm going to give you all of me. I don't want this world of order. There's nothing in it but death. But God, in you is life. So Holy Spirit, fill me. Help me to walk circumspect to who I say I am in God. Let me have integrity about who I am. God, let me love you. Let me obey you. Let me serve you. So I can be a true ambassador of Jesus. See, when we got adopted, that should change us, change the way we think. It, it should change us. We know that we're in the world, but we realize we're not of it. That we have an eternal mindset to know that one day, one day, we're going to see Jesus face to face. And, and we want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your perfect word. God, you're such a good and gracious God. You've been so good to all of us. God, we ask that you would take this word that we've heard today, Lord, that we will hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you, but God, that we would use it as fuel to be everything that you have called us to be. Thank you, Lord, for adopting us. Thank you for the great price that you were willing to pay that we could become the righteousness of God. So God, we just conclude the matter that from this day forward, we're choosing to operate in such a way, God, of our new identity in Christ. So God, we praise you, we bless you, and we thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to move to a time of communion. If you don't have communion, just raise your hands. One of our ushers will get that to you. And I think it's so awesome. We do this every Sunday here at Powerhouse because we want to pause and we just want to reflect on the goodness of God that these elements make it possible for our adoption. That it was the payment for our adoption. And it was expensive. This payment cost Jesus his life. I don't know what it takes to motivate you. But when I look at these elements, I'm motivated. I'm thinking, Jesus, if you could die for me, that I might have eternal life, I can truly live for you, love you, and suffer for you. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he said, this is my body that will be broken for you. And as we think about our Lord Jesus and we think about his body being broken, bruised, and beaten for us, that we see his love. Let's take, let's eat together. Likewise, on the night before he was betrayed, he took wine and he told his disciples, this is the new covenant in my blood that will be poured out and spilled for you. It is the blood of Jesus that makes us the righteous of God in Christ. When we think about how do we get to the Father, how do we get eternal life, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That by God's grace, there is a way. And so as we think about his precious blood that was poured out for us, that created that way so that we never have to taste death but go from glory to glory, that this blood would take care of our sin problem, past, present, and future. That the Father would look at us through blood-stained lenses and say, look at my children. They are the righteousness of God. 
So as we thank our Lord and Savior, let's take and let's drink together. Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful gift that you've given in your son. We thank you, God, that you love us with an unfailing love. God, I just pray by your spirit that you would help us, Lord, to see how wide, how deep your love is for us. And God, that we would reciprocate that love the best that we can towards you. But Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're not just our savior, but you're also our healer. And so we just ask, God, that those who need healing in this place, whether it's relational, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, God, would you bring healing and restoration? Would you touch, Lord? So I just decree and declare from the crown of the head and the soles of the feet of everyone, Lord, here and online, God, I decree healing in Jesus' name. That, God, you would do what we can't do. That your word tells us, God, that sometimes we... Have not because we ask not. So, God, we're asking right now. We ask, God, that you would bring financial healing, relational healing. God, we pray for that prodigal son or daughter to come home. God, we pray for healing over marriages. We pray for a oneness in the, in the unity of the peace, God, through your spirit. We pray, God, that you would touch, that you would heal what's broken and make it whole. But, God, even if you don't. <laughs> We love you with an unfailing love because you first loved us. And so, God, we thank you that those that you're touching, those you're restoring, those, God, that you are making whole right now, we say thank you. And we bless you, God, for your kindness towards us. So, God, may we continue to live a life that's pleasing to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause and our pastor for that amazing word today. Well, again, if you are new here at Powerhouse Church, we want to do life with you. And this Saturday, we are inviting people to our house for Experiencing God Bible study for the men at 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. And we're going to do something a little different this weekend. We're going to have the women come earlier at 10.15 so we can pray um, for the nation, and not just for the nation, but for our communities, for our families, and for ourselves, for our marriages. Anything that the Lord puts on our hearts in order to pray. And so women, I don't know if we're actually going to be doing Experiencing God. We're just going to allow the Spirit to lead us to whatever He wants us to do during that time um, till 1 p.m. And we also want to grow deeper together. So on Tuesdays, we have Bible study at 6.30 till 8 PM and Wednesday nights we have hour of power prayer and that is 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. on a conference line so we hope you join us for that and don't forget to fill out those connect cards because we want to know how we can pray for you and uh Pastor will always meet with you for breakfast or for coffee in order to get to know you and let you know the vision for the church. And if you would like to partner with us, a few ways to give is on powerhousechurchlv.com. And we have a black box in the back that you can put in with the envelopes. Other than that, um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, so much for this word, Lord. We thank you that you see us through the blood of Jesus who made us clean, pure, and holy before you and righteous. And so we thank you, God, that we will walk out the spirit of adoption in our lives, in our families, in our relationships, the way that we talk, Lord, the way that we move, the way that we think, Lord, that we will just take you everywhere that we go and that we just lay aside every sinful desire that is ha or has been attached to us, Lord, and we receive the adoption of your spirit, of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you that we can walk with you in all of our lives moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful night.